Praise God. Praise God. I want to thank, I want to thank Sister Danielle for that beautiful song. So much more is worth fighting for. Happy Sabbath, Saints, and it's indeed a joy to be with you today. I want to thank my good friend, Pastor Philip, your pastor, for the opportunity to be able to share with you today from God's word. It is my hope and prayer that as we engage in this manner, that his will will be done. Uh, but before pressing any further, I want to thank Sister, Sister Wigan for her, her very kind words of introduction and her, her gift of investigation. <laughs> we'll leave that there. And I also want to extend a happy anniversary to my friend and his wife. We pray that God will continue to bless you immensely as you keep pressing forward with him and for him in ministry. Happy Sabbath, church. Uh, to all of you out there in in the land of the internet, I just want to ask that God's uh, tremendous blessings will just surround you wherever you are. It's always a, a joy when God's people can come together. Um, every now and then, one of the passages and the promises that I like to go back to is when Jesus himself uh, promised that where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, I am in their midst. Uh, you know, I was giving some thought to that just recently, and I said, said, you know what, it's an absolute beautiful thing that Jesus did not say if three or two or three are gathered in my name in the church. Otherwise, the past 18 months for us would have mean that he is not around. But because he says gather together in my name, the fact that we are able to come together even via the online platform, we have the assurance that he's there. So do me a favor, turn to the person next to you. If you are alone, uh, just, just remind yourself or tell the person who's next to you, Jesus is here, don't miss him. Jesus is here, don't miss him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the next few minutes, saints, I want to speak to you on a very interesting topic. When God sees my worship, I want to thank Elder the Elder Ellis for his reading of the scripture reading, uh, but I want to just read a portion of it again. So let me just invite you to turn your Bibles with me to, to Luke chapter 7, and I will be reading in your hearing verses 7 all the way down to, sorry, verses 44 all the way down to 47. But before we do so, your heads bowed and your eyes closed as we pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, we bless and we magnify your holy name. Even now, O oh Lord, we have come by this place not to hear from a man, but to hear you. So Lord, with your word open before us, we ask, O oh God, that you will come divinely closer to us all. And even as your people are awaiting a word from you, Lord, speak to our hearts. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of God of our hearts will indeed be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our amazing Redeemer, let's agree by saying, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm reading from verse 44. The Bible says, Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. When God sees my worship, you know, worship, saints, is not only central to the Christian experience, but worship is also central in human life. Uh, it is impossible to be a Christian and not worship. Unfortunately, and forgive me for going there, but I have to. What we normally call worship is sometimes far from what worship really is. And that is because there are some aspects of worship uh, that are often forgotten. Now, for the purpose of our study today, we will look at three of them. But before we, we go there, I think a definition of worship is necessary. 
Now, the Greek word worship is a combination of two words, pros kuneo. A pros, which means two words, and kuneo, which means, observe me well, to kiss. In other words, it is a personal relationship giving homage or adoration to the object of worship. Now, our current English word worship is even more interesting. It is from the old English word worship. Over time, the tea got lost, uh, which means to give worth to. So whatever is worshipped is worthy or deserving. In other words, the object of our worship gets our highest adoration and love. Now that we've established that, here are the three facts about worship that affects you and me today. Number one, worship is inevitable. It is in our genetic makeup to worship. So everybody worships. And everybody has things that they deem worthy of their highest adoration. Now, some people worship deity like us Christians do. Uh, some worship beauty. Others worship their bodies, while others worship money. Now, even atheists, interestingly, who bash people who worship, they also worship. Whether it is philosophies, principles, or ideas, everybody worships something. Worship, by virtue of its meaning, is inescapable. Fact number two, your worship is an indicator of your current journey and your eventual destination. What am I talking about? You see, because the object of our worship consumes us, our time, our resources, our efforts and attention are mostly directed there. Now, if the vibe at the club is of worth to you, then your finances, your friends, and your activities in one way or another will not be too heavily church-based because that's not, where, that's not where your heart is. Fact number three, and that one is probably the most uh, critical one for our message today, God sees our worship. Now, I'm not here talking about the outward display uh, that, we, that we give forth when we engage in worship. I'm here talking about the inward trajectory of our hearts. In other words, since uh, what you and I might be seeing on the outside is not what's going on on the inside. And God, by virtue of him being who he is, is able to peel back the many layers of our lives and to look deep in our hearts and to see our worship. Now, those three facts make it clear that one of the most important things in life is worship. Why? Observe with me well, because we are always worshiping. Whether you go to the store or, or you, you, you are on the bus, we are always worshiping if we understand the meaning of the word. Now, as we focus on the topic, when God sees my worship, it's deliberate uh, because we want to look at the question, what does God really see? When God sees my worship, what does he really see? Our passage of meditation details the experience of two worshipers. And we will begin to delve into it. Now, you might say to me, uh, but pastor, there is, there is no church setting and there is no praise team. How come there is worship? If you just wait with me as we press on in the passage, we'll realize that Jesus Christ himself makes that very clear. So in verse 36 of our scripture reading, verse 36 begins to set for us the stage for the story that we are going to look at. The Bible says, then one of the Pharisees, asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Let us put together a mental picture of this Palestinian dinner setting. Uh, it was the norm back then for men of stature like the Pharisees to host special guests. And they would invite the who's who to attend, the, the big guns to attend. Now there would be a special area for hosting guests that would be close to the house. Now, in that very special place, it would be an open setting. And one of the main reasons why it would be open, it was so that the neighbors could see the festivities and hopefully be in awe and to speak about how, how great a, a, a party it was. 
Now, it was common practice for those neighbors to stand at an expected distance and not to venture any further. Uh, for those of us who are from, from small towns like I am, uh, whenever a wedding is take, taking place in the community, it's very easy to know the difference between those who are part of the wedding and those who are not for two reasons. Number one, number one, those who are part of the wedding are, are nicely dressed and those who are not are in their regular clothes. But number two, number two, somehow there is an unwritten rule that if you are not part of the wedding, you can come this particular distance from what is happening and look on and spectate, but you cannot come in any further. So that was the case here. And normally back in the, in the days of, of Christ, those crowds would not only come to, to spectate, but in anticipation for whatever leftovers might, might, they might be able to get their hands on. Now, in this Middle Eastern setting, when, when a, a, a party of that nature would be thrown, uh, the food would be laid beautifully, not very well, on the floor. Today we have our tables and chairs, but that, that was not the case back then. The food would be laid on the floor, uh, probably with cushions around it. And as the guests would come in, their heads would be facing the food, and they would be leaning, uh, supporting their body weight on their left arm, and they would use their right hand to eat, and their left and their feet, rather, would be behind them away from the phenomenon going there just so that you can understand uh, what we are about to delve into. So just imagine with me, all the guests are seated. They're all facing the food. Uh, Jesus, who is growing in popularity, is the guest of honor. And Simon, who invited him, feels contented because of this social success. There is conversation in the air. There is laughter. A jubilant spirit is, is there. And it promises to be a phenomenal night. And all of a sudden, it takes a turn. Verse 37 tells us, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, alabaster flask of fragrant oil. Uh, this woman, friends, is described not by her name, but by her lifestyle. That is critical. Uh, the Bible tells us she was a sinner. Now, it is known uh, that, that in, in those small settings, those small town settings, because everybody knows everybody, uh, she's known to be a prostitute. And, and because she is known by everyone, it is understandable here that Luke would refer to her by her lifestyle and not by her name. And these are the type of people that folks tend to look down on. These are the type of people that folks tend to, tend to try to be away from. Well, some of them, if I may put it that way, some of them are okay being close to them at night, but not during the day. But this woman, observe with me, did not come to the dinner party to be a spectator. She did not come to join those who were looking on. We know that uh, she came with a mission because the Bible tells us she came because she knew Jesus was there. But that's not all. That's not all. We are also told that she came equipped with an expensive perfumed oil for Jesus. Friends, this woman did not come seeking forgiveness. When you look at the rest of the passage, we will discover that she came to worship. Uh, she came because she was already forgiven and wanted to express her gratitude to Jesus. I don't know if somebody is, 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 is excited with me here yet. The Bible does not tell us when she encountered Christ or when her deliverance took place, but the passage makes it very clear. You read all of it, it makes it very clear that she came not to be forgiven, but to express gratitude for the forgiveness she received. Some commentators believe that probably when Christ was preaching, uh, maybe she heard him when he declared, come unto me all those who are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And she heard and, and that's when her transformation took place. We do not know, but we know that it took place. And what she does next is unthinkable. She breaks a norm. She isn't dressed for or invited to the party, but she breaks the line and proceeds perfuming hand to where Jesus is lying. Now, I can just imagine the murmuring that began among the spectators. Some, some folks are wondering, what is she doing? Has she lost her mind? Not only is she not, the, not invited there, 
But, but, but who does she think she is to go there? But I have come to discover, friends of mine, that when you have engaged, engaged God in the most intimate of ways, you come out of that experience, no good thing well, and your shame no longer have a hold on you. I don't know if someone has been there. Uh, other people's opinions of your past fades in comparison to the joy that swells your heart because of what the Lord has done for you. She was deaf to the critics and unhinged by the norms because this overwhelming desire to worship Jesus arrested her and moved her in his direction. Ah, says, let me put it to you in a different way. When the Lord has taken a hold of your life, when he has taken a hold of your life, you begin to experience this transformation deep within. And that transformation deep within is what begins to dictate your life. All of a sudden, other people's opinion does not matter anymore. So she makes her way to Jesus. And verse 48 tells us, and she stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with a the fragrant oil. Let me, let me make something clear. She approaches Jesus. He's still lying on the floor with his head facing the food. And she comes and she, she stands directly, directly behind him. Now, if you, if you observe the passage, this woman did not come with the intention of washing Jesus' his feet. No, she came only with a flask of oil. If she wanted to wash his feet, she would have brought water on a towel. She came to massage his feet with the expensive oil, but when she gets there, something she did not plan for took place. She becomes overtaken with emotions and begins to weep uncontrollably. When the Bible tells us here that she was weeping, the Greek word used here, friends of mine, means to wail aloud. So as she sobs, an enormous amount of tears well her eyes and fall on his feet, making a mess. Now, uh, before I go any further ahead, let me let me put it to you this way. I, I don't know what your experience is, but, but but for me, coming from a Caribbean setting, you know, when something would have happened, probably my, my, my mom gave me one of her favorite beatings, and I would have cried, yes, and the crying would have stopped. Maybe someone would have stopped, would have passed by, realized that, that there were dry tears on my eyes, and they would ask what happened, and the minute I would begin to recount to them what happened, I would begin to cry again. Not because, not because I got a fresh beating, but because I'm remembering what happened. This woman, friends of mine, remembered hallelujah. She was able to go back. She, as she stood be, be, be behind Jesus, she was able to go back. She remembered her past. She remembered what she went through. She remembered how much she wanted to be delivered. And then she remembered what happened to her when by faith, you observe verse, verse 15, we're not going to read it, but when by faith, she accepted what he said. She remembered the transformation that took place. And that's why the tears began to roll down her eyes. Hallelujah. So she sobs, and the mess is there, and she notices it, and not having a towel, she does something else that is unsinkable. You see, the norm back then, ladies and gentlemen, was that women would always have their hair covered. But she immediately uh, uh, breaks an other norm, and she pulls out her hair, and she began to wipe the tears from his feet with her hair. And as she progressed in, in, in getting the tears off, she proceeds to kiss his feet. Now, I want to spend some time on that word here, uh, uh, but not just any kiss. The word used here describes the kissing as being one done in others. In other words, there was emotion behind the kiss. There was a meaning behind the kiss. Friends, her entire being was kissing him. And she then applies the perfume and she just pours it and pours it and pours it. Now just imagine with me here. Imagine with, with me here. The conversation around, around the food stops. Her crying became the only sound to be heard. The scent of her fragrance oil fills the place. And everyone is looking at her and they're looking at each other and they're trying to figure out what to do next. And here's what amazes me. Through all of this, through all of these things, 
Jesus never even turned to look at her. Neither did he stop her, which means that even though others had a problem with it, he did not. In other words, friends of mine, he accepted her worship. He accepted her worship. I don't know uh, what it might mean for some persons here, but here's something that I want to bring out to you here, sis. Uh, when you have gotten that to that particular place with God, where your transformation has taken place, you, he does something in you, through you, and for you, whereby the opinion of other people just does not matter anymore. So even though folks might have their, their, their opinion about you, irrespective, follow me well, of what they know about your past, you just don't care anymore. Why? Because the, the love of God has gotten a hold of you. Let me, let, me, let me share this example with you here. I have this young lady who a friend of mine, just, just an amazing young person. She struggled for a long time, born and raised in the Seventh Adventist Church, but struggled for an absolute long time. Got married, but was still not as faithful as she was supposed to, to have been. You know, occasionally would, would, would go clubbing and so on, have a very successful business, but, 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 but she was just not all in with God. And then things began to go downhill. Her, 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 her marriage was being threatened. Her husband was not being faithful. And she stood to lose her kids. And, and, and it's like she was just losing it. And I remember speaking to her and uh, even before that began to happen. And I tried to encourage her to be faithful to God. And she was just saying yes. But then you could have seen that, that, that it was just not happening for her. And as that young lady got to a place one night when she, she was going to give up, she was going to give up, jump in the car, kiss her kids goodbye, was going to commit suicide, uh, decided somehow the spirit impressed on her to call a friend. She did that. That friend at midnight was still up praying. Went to that friend's home. Long story short, this young lady uh, experienced that night her transformation. Let me put it to you this way, since after that experience, she came out a different person, a different person, to the point where uh, when folks began to see that there was a difference in her, they became, they became worried with her. They became concerned about her. Can I speak to the church here? Is that all right? Uh, folks from the church began to judge her. People began to question her authenticity. And uh, somehow she just allowed it to roll off and she just pressed on her. Here's why, here's why. She explained to me that the joy that God gave to her, hallelujah, that joy so overwhelms her that she was able to press on. Here's what amazed me about her life even, even more. When she was sharing with me about her transformation, Transformation. Uh, she was so excited, says, and just imagine with me that her husband was not back home yet. Not back home yet. The point I'm trying to bring out to you here is this when the heart have experienced God, when the heart have experienced God, worship takes place in a particular place that the average person does not understand. What am I talking about? What am I talking about? Uh, the Bible explains to me in the book of John chapter 4, Jesus was the one who says uh, that, 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 that a time is coming when persons will worship him in spirit. And in truth, I want you to understand with me here that worship in spirit and in truth is not just an idea, it's a place. <laughs> it's a place, friends of mine, where God himself exists and dwells. So when we find ourselves there, that is what genuine worship is. So here's what I want to say to you as I focus here on this woman's situation. Uh, uh, I want to say to folks here, don't, don't, don't try to legislate my praise to God for my healing when you have not experienced my wounds. Don't try to put a caption on my response to God for my deliverance when you do not understand the hell I've been trying to escape. Do not get in the way of my excitement to God for my blessings when the pain of my backstory is not comprehended by you. When you don't understand where I'm coming from, uh, be careful with my worship. Because I'm happy here. Uh, even though she broke so many norms, Jesus accepted her worship. But well, you see, worship entails your authentic personal response to God. And not everyone will understand it. Not everyone will approve of it. But if the Lord accepts it, then that settles it. That settles it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, verse 49 tells us, the story begins to take a bit of a twist. You know, uh, uh, let, let's, let, let's read it. First, says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. 
He spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Hmm. Hmm. Fred, not only is Simon not happy about her crushing his party, but he is now rethinking his invitation about Jesus, and he also degrades her in the same sentence. He says, uh, in light of Jesus, if this man were a prophet, observe with me, he would know. If he were a prophet, he would be aware. If he were a prophet, he would see. You see, Simon concludes that Jesus lacks spiritual insight. As far as he's concerned, Jesus is spiritually blind. Then Simon places this woman at the bottom of human scum. Here is the thing. He refers to her as this manner of woman who is a sinner. Here is what's exciting here says. Simon had no clue, hallelujah, that she was no longer a sinner. He was judging her by her past, judging her by the clothes that she's wearing, judging her based on whatever perception he's had of her and not knowing that God saw differently. You see, friends, one of the things that I have uh, come to appreciate about God in my personal life is him showing up to defend me even when I am completely outgunned and even when I am not aware of the attack or the attacker. You see, uh, Jesus does something amazing. Uh, Simon attacks her, but Jesus steps in on her behalf. You see, when you are a child of God, somebody... When you are a child of God, you don't need to know what your enemy is planning against you. You don't even need to understand the details of the plan. As long as you are hidden in him, he protects you and he fights for you. So Simon is thinking this in his mind, attacking her and degrading her in his mind. And Jesus responds, verse 40 tells us, and Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, to Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Tisha, say, forgive me since I'm getting a little bit hot here. He says, Tisha, say. And then by saying say, Simon actually made a mistake because the thing about Christ, when he begins to speak, he always weighs heavily. And then he, he breaks down, he goes into this parable recorded in verses 41 to 43. He says, listen, there, there was this creditor who had two debtors. One was owing him 500 denarius and the other 50. Now, just to give you some context here, 500 denarii in today's time. I'm not talking about the actual transfer, transformation, but, but like it would have been to today. It meant that this person was owing him three and a half times the a year's wage of the average worker. In other words, about 45,000 pounds. The other person, 50 denarius, is, is owing only about 3,800 pounds. Then, then, then Jesus uh, proceeds and Jesus tells him, uh, 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 none of them were able to pay back. None of them were able to pay back. And the creditor forgave them both. Christ told him, who, which one of them do you think would love him the most? And his answer to him, he says, I suppose, he can even answer straight. He says, I suppose the one that was forgiven most. Jesus told him, yes, you've spoken well. Then friends of mine, Jesus does something that no one should do in a person's home, especially when a person has invited you to their home. Here's the context of what Jesus does next. You see, it is also the norm back then that when guests come to your home for a special occasion, like the one we are looking at, that they would first be welcomed by a greeter with kisses. Then someone would wash their feet from the dust accumulated from the, palace, from the streets of Palestine. Then their feet would be rubbed with olive oil. And because of the occasion, each guest would have a touch of, of different perfumed oils on their head so that there would be a nice aroma in the place. And here's what Christ does. Here's what Christ does. Jesus, friends, is an absolute radical. <laughs> I love how blessed it. Here's what he does. In verse 44, then he turned to the woman. And said to Simon, said, Simon, do you, do you see this woman? That's a strange question. Of course he sees her because she's there. But you see, he asks that uh, against the backdrop that, that Simon has already concluded that Jesus is blind. So Christ is now asking him, are, are you blind? Do you see this woman? He says, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. 
but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman, hallelujah, has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Jesus compares the two worshipers. Let's, let's examine the comparison here. Simon gave no water for his feet. The woman, we are told, uh, washed his feet with her tears and dried them with the hair of her head. Now, there is something interesting here. Uh, remember, she's a sinner. Remember, she's a prostitute, which means the same hair that her clients would pass their hands through. That's the hair she used to wipe his feet. I'm going in a very troublesome place here. Simon gave him no kiss, but the same lips that has gone to wherever is what she uses to kiss his feet. Uh, Simon did not anoint his head, but the perfumed oil, and mind you, given her status, she has no way of earning that oil, it, or that a very expensive perfume. That perfume would have cost about 300 denarius, about one year's wage, says. It means that that perfume was, is most likely uh, a payment by a very expensive, uh, a very rich client, but, but that's what she uses. Her, her, her is what I'm saying here. Jesus is basically saying to Simon, Simon, out of your abundance, you could have spent a small portion to show the expected level of hospitality, but you did not. But this woman took the best of what she had. Let me say this again. Let me say this again. Somebody needs to hear this. Uh, this woman took the best of what she had. And you will tell me, but, but Pastor, she used her hair that her clients touch when she's sitting. And, uh, and my answer to you is, that's the best of what she had. You said to me, Pastor, she used her lips that have been to wherever. And my answer to you is, that's the best of what she had. And you would tell me, but but, but Pastor, she also used this perfume that she got from her, from her illicit trade. And my answer to you would be, that was the best of what she had. She took the best of what she had, says, and she gave it to him. So this woman took the best of what she had, and she gave it all. So Jesus, hallelujah, is saying to Simon, I can see what you deem worthy and what she deems worthy. In other words, in other words, in other words, Simon, you might accuse me of being blind, but I want you to know that I see your worship and I see hers. Mm. And what I have seen in your worship, Simon, is that even though you invited me to your house, it was more for the praise that it would bring to you, not so much for the, for the hospitality that you would offer me. It was more for the applause that the church audience would give after you sing that song, and not so much because I am your audience of one. It is more because of the adulation you receive because of your service, not so much because of the adoration to the king that, 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 that is supposed to go to the king of kings and the lord of all lords. In other words, Jesus is here saying to Simon, I see your worship, but I also see hers. Hmm. Mm. I also see hers. You see, friends of mine, Simon didn't understand that because worship is in every trouble, that when he invited Christ over, he was in worship mode. Uh, he did not understand that his worship was an indicator of the fact that he, uh, uh, an indicator rather of his journey and his eventual destination if he kept where he was. In other words, in other words, at that point, he did not give God his best because his worship was not so much God above, but he his worship was more himself. Now, when God sees my worship, what does he see? When he sees my worship, what does he see? Are the sentiments of my heart towards kissing him? You see, friends of mine, worship literally entails like giving God my best. You know, after five years or so into, in, into full-time ministry, something very troublesome dawned on me uh, when the church was called. Concern. And what is that something? Let me share with, with you. What done on me, friends, what done on me is that doing church was easy, but being church had to be deliberate. So let me say that again. Let me say that again. I'm going to say that again. Doing church is easy, 
But being church has to be deliberate. What am I talking about? You see, the prayers offered, we normally do it out of custom because we are used to it. The ministry that is done is normally done out of habit. If I am brilliant at Sabbath school or at AY, it's easy to put a program together and execute it. The singing done, is, 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 it, 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 it normally comes out of being the norm for us. But, 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 but follow me here well. Uh, praying in spirit, since calls for reaching with in me mm. and ministering in power uh, uh, needs connecting with God and singing that brings conviction has to be anointed. What I'm trying to say to you here is this it's easy to simply give the outward without paying attention to the inward. So, worship entails giving God my absolute best. My absolute best. So being in the church, you, it, you, you can become complacent with God and begin to take for granted what he has done for you. Uh, I do not want to be, I personally do not want to be so caught up in, the, in, in, the mo, in what the moment has to offer me, rather, that I miss out on the praise that I should be offering him. Because worship is all about God sins. I want someone here to appreciate with me. Worship is all about God, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and Sister, let me put it to you in a different way. It is very easy simply because we are folks who are used to being in church to take the concept of worship for granted. But because you are always in worship mode, you must be deliberate about it. And But worship, genuine worship, is something that comes deep within you, not just what happens on the surface. Then Jesus makes... One of the sweetest and the most insane statements that I have ever read from him. And I remain constantly overwhelmed at the beautiful assurance in that statement. I really invite you to follow with me as I read verse 47. Verse 47 here is absolutely critical. The Bible says to me in verse 47, Therefore, I say to you, it's Christ speaking, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Now, 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 let me just pause here. I'm pausing here. Here is the reason. I want you in your own time to just look at that text again and try to understand what he's saying. I, therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. It appears, it appears that Jesus is saying here that many sins forgiven equals much love. And little sins forgiven equals little love. So the question is, is Jesus here saying that for me to love him immensely like this woman, that I must sin terribly first? That does not sound like what my Lord is saying. You see, the point here, since is the extent of the sin forgiven. And here's where, here's where I get excited. You see, if I understand what Christ is here saying to Simon, he is not telling Simon that this woman is showing more love because Simon is incapable. He said to Simon, hey, Simon, actually, everybody owes 500. Everybody owes 500. The problem is, Simon, the problem is, Simon, you chose to offer only 50. You reached out, you reached down in your, in, in your heart, and you did not lay everything before God. Be, because you gave only 50, that created a problem for you. But if we are honest with ourselves, since like Paul, we will say, I am the chief of sinners. Why? Because we all owe 500. Let me, let me, let me just go down on this hair a bit. <laughs> let me go down on this hair a bit. If I'm understanding what Christ is saying, Jesus is there saying to Simon, actually, Simon, the relationship, the two means the worship. Oh, somebody didn't get that. Somebody didn't get that. Somebody is not getting excited here. The relationship determines the worship. What am I saying? You see, if I have given God my 500 in relationship, my 500 worth of worship will follow. Mm. You see, too often, friends of mine, time is spent dissecting the worship while little attention is paid to the relationship. Now, if the relationship is healthy, the worship will be healthy. But if the relationship is messed up, so will be the worship. And you see, for Simon, the worship was not on the guest sitting in his house, but on his own accomplishment. His worship was messed up. That's what his, his worship was messed up. Rather, the relationship was messed up. But as a result of that, his worship of Christ 
was messed up. Let me go a bit further here for you. You see, you, you see, friends of mine, uh, when it comes to God and who he is and how he functions and what he's doing for us as his people, it is important to understand that we are all broken. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, I thank you, Lord. We are all broken saints. We are all broken now. Now, just because your brokenness is different from mine, just because the world says that my brokenness is worse than yours, does not mean that we all don't owe 500. We all owe 500. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been in the church. Take a good deep look deep in within you. Uh, look, take a good look at who you are. Uh, the, the Paul puts it this way. Paul says that we all struggle with a sin that easily besets us. Mm. You see, your journey with God is not mine. Uh, you may have begun your journey a long time ago. You may have been ahead of me, but if you look back at your life, you will discover that neither you or me uh, were actually really in, in a place where we deserve the love of God. Friends, we all owe 500. Lord have mercy. We are all 500. Let me let me jump on me here for for now. Let me jump on me here. You see, I I I I as I reflect on my life, and I like to be very real, especially when we are having family worship. I try to keep nothing at all from my kids. When I look back at my life, where I grew up from in the ghetto in my community in Saint Lucia, when I look at some of the things I've done, I was supposed to have been in prison for some of them. Can I be honest here, since Can I be honest here, since There are some things that I've done. That I'm ashamed of. Uh, there's some places that I've been that I'm just not deserving of what God has done for me. But I'm looking back at it. Hallelujah. And I'm excited. You know why? Because 2,000 plus years ago, long before he knew me, he went on that cross, died for my sins. Why? Because he looked down in my community, realized that there was a young man who was going the wrong way, who needed a turn back, and he directed people my way. You see, when my worship to God, your worship to God, is not because there's anything within us. It is simply a response to God's first move towards us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I must not be in a place where I will judge your brokenness. Woo! Lord, help me, Jesus. I cannot judge your brokenness because I'm still struggling with my own. Let's put it this way. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how much you've been in the church and how faithful you have been. For every single one of us, we still walk with our limp. Mm. We still walk with our limp. So just because someone else's limp might be a little bit heavier than yours, don't jump in the place and do a Simon to begin to judge them. I don't know if somebody is hearing me here. I love that. Uh, says I, when, when, when I look back, some writer says over my life, and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. And I have not one, but so many testimonies. Let me just share one of them with you very quickly. In the year 2014, I was in the midst of, of preaching an evangelistic campaign. And there was a struggle. The struggle since uh, uh, entails the fact that, of course, my, my district was about 800 strong. So I am leading 800 plus plus members of the church um, are, are in an evangelistic endeavor, but I have a struggle at home. What's my struggle at home? My struggle at home since is that my wife is ill and there's a strong possibility that she might not make it. And her illness, since I cannot go into the details because of, of, of the complexities of it, and for personal issues, the illness was such that it, it was gradually, gradually affecting her, gradually taking her away. And it got to the point since where, uh, you know, at night I'm preaching, but but my mind is just in a different place. Mm -hmm. And all of our funds, all of our finances were gone in medical expenses and no doctor could say what was wrong with her. Mm. And I remember one this particular afternoon when we came from the doctor the last time, the doctor said to her, well, actually your next step will have to be for you to go to this particular specialist and this specialist is going to require X amount to carry out a medical procedure to figure out what is wrong. And since we are completely broke, 
So broke, we were broken. Lord have mercy. No money whatsoever. And, you know, I remember walking with my wife from the doctor's office, you know, uh, aiding her as she was walking on because she was that weak, uh, trying to get to the car to get home. And, and, and at that point, she prayed. I had no clue, but she prayed, pouring her heart out to God. Long story short, uh, about a week later on, I, I, I told the saints, listen, please keep my wife in prayer. At the campaign, told the saints, keep my wife in prayer uh, because she's not well. I didn't go into details. Immediately after the campaign, this sister came to her and told her, hey, Sister Vitalis, actually, uh, 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 your husband said this, and I remember that God told me, Reverend, I'm talking about God, hallelujah. She says, God told me, to give you something, it's in my car, and I, keep, I kept forgetting to give it to you. She went to her car, brought an envelope to my wife. When my wife opened it, it was the exact amount of money she needed to carry out the medical procedure. Let me, let me take this a bit further for you here. Let me take this a bit further for you here. Um, when my wife realized that I sent one of our girls to call her, she came back. Wife told her, sister, you said God told you? She says, yes, God told me. She says, when did God tell you? Now, this sister in question is a teacher. And, um, and uh, uh, she explained to my wife, well, actually, on this particular day, my wife realized the same day that she prayed. She said, I was doing my, my prayer uh, because she was doing a prayer and fasting. So when the kids went out for lunch, instead of, of going to have lunch, she stayed in to do her prayer. And she says, at that point in time, God impressed on me to give you X amount of money that I had in the bank. That's all she had in the bank. I don't know if someone is hearing me here. God have mercy. That's all she had in the bank. And my wife realized that the same time that we were leaving the doctor's office is about the same time that a sister was praying during the midday time. Oh, oh Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. So, so, so here's where, here's where I'm going with this is. So when, when, when I get to a point, when I get to a point where I'm going to worship God, don't get in my way. That's why. You don't know where I've been. You don't know my backstory. You don't understand where I was and how difficult it was and how the Lord pulled me through. Don't get involved in people's worship. I don't know if someone is appreciating this here today. But in order, in order for you to give your 500, in order for you to give your all, you must do what Paul says, examine yourself. Too often, since too often, we take the concept of worship for granted. We just come in the church and we sit and we just go through a, a, a routine. Are we really looking deep down within us to see what is done that we need to give God praise for? Too often, examine yourself. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me go a bit further with, with you here. It, it, it's going to entail a, a personal devotional time. Since, since uh, the, the worship is dependent on the relationship, when you spend personal time with God, here's what he's going to do for you. That's what he's going to do for you. When he spends personal devotional time with God, he constantly transforms you and he changes you. You begin to develop intimacy with him and the church, the cross, and, and the Christ. Hallelujah. Like I said a while ago, it's all about broken people. And he mends our brokenness only when we admit it. You know something I love about the Bible? You know the word confession means to agree with God. Hallelujah. And the Bible tells me if I don't confess, I cannot receive anything from God. In other words, since I have to agree with God about the reality of my mess. I have to agree with God about the reality of his blessing. I must not take for granted the fact that I woke up this morning. Hey, if you are going to worship God, you need to go deep with him. Deep with him. You see, intimacy with God produces not simply an organizational, but an organic experience with God. Mm. And that transcendent experience that takes place in spirit and truth leads to an organic worship. Mm. You see, the reason she was able to defy her critics and her past is because the relationship took place in a different sphere. Mm. So Jesus was basically saying to Simon, listen, Simon, you might not know it, but 
that woman has been forgiven a long time. Don't judge her on the way that she came dressed. Don't judge her on the fact that she broke the norm and came into your party uninvited. Don't judge her on the fact, hallelujah, that her hair is all let down the place and she, and she still, still looks like a prostitute. Don't judge on what you know about her past. Here is what I want to say to you, Simon. I have looked in her heart, Simon, and I have seen her worship. So here's a question, since I'm trying to bring this to a close. When God sees my worship, what does he see? When God sees my worship, what does he see? A friend of mine, amazing young man. Well, I call him young, interestingly. He's older than, than I am. He was a young man who grew up in the church. And I'm, I'm going to a very troublesome place here. And very active in the church, musician, singing in groups. But his reality said, his reality was he would be in the church on Sabbath, take up AY Sabbath afternoon, and at the club Saturday night. So for him, church was just uh, as a result of his social orientation. It's what he was used to. So every Sabbath, he just goes. And after a while, he crashed, left church, and just, you know, went on his, his way. And one night, while he was at the club, letting loose, God took a hold of him there, saying, Sai, I, I, I want to just, just plug this here just to add this in. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the most important thing you can do in your life is to pursue God and get to that place where you experience him on a one-on-one. -on -one. Other people's experience won't cut it for you. Other people's testimonies will not do it for you. You need to experience him for you. Otherwise, you're just toying around. You're just messing around, and that will get you nowhere. So he, 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 he got to that particular place since, and when he got to that particular place with God, this brother experienced conversion for the first time. Let me let, let me just pull back here, pull back here. You see, when he had that experience, when he left, he was in his in his uh, uh, mid late, well, early to mid thirties, and for the first time in his life, he experienced conversion. When he came back, that brother became a mighty preacher for God. He's now a pastor and doing phenomenal works for God. What I'm trying to say to you here is simply this is, because the relationship determines the worship. Uh, worship does not come empty. When your worship takes place, God is going to anoint you. He's going to bless you, and the fruits of your labor will be seen. So the question is, what does God see when God sees my worship? What does God see when God sees my worship? Does God see a facade like Simon did on the outside and outside an outward show? Or does God see the beauty of one's heart's response to him like this unnamed woman? What does God see when he see our worship? Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. But we thank you for the assurance of salvation. Father, we thank you, O oh God, that we all have 500 to give. Help us all, O oh God, to look deep within us and to be honest about where we are and to give you genuine praise and adoration for who you are, not just lip service, O oh Lord. I pray that blessing upon every single one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.